shameless, selfish, selfish plug, I guess. Uh, Corel's ICM database. Just a few slides here. We'll go over the background, talk about where we get our data, and we'll have a, I got a couple of slides on what we have in there right now. <coughs> so it was developed at Corel in the early 90s. The goal was to provide timely ice jam information to USACE, uh, USACE Army Corps. We, it was not public in the beginning. This was mainly to report up our chain to our emergency management our, um, and up to the generals in DC. And it was really for you know their sit reps every week, all the stuff that they would do in the past. Uh, as it's grown, the goal now is really to coordinate response to ice jams and to assist in long-term planning. Right? We built the database, so now we actually have, you know, it's not complete, never will be, obviously, because so much of this doesn't get reported or is anecdotal or whatever, but um, we've built the only nationwide ice jam database that we know of, at least in the U.S. It is all publicly available now, albeit our website issues from time to time that we can thank to uh, DOD security problems generally is what the issue is. But um, our data, where we where we find out about ice jams, because we're we're a very small outfit. This is like me working on this. You know, there's not a whole team of people or anything monitoring this stuff. I've got uh, I've got a web developer, a database manager who helps me with the coding and the you know really smart guy stuff. I've got me that looks through all of this and basically determines whether something is actually an ice jam or not, and then I input it into the database and we send <coughs> that information out into the ether. Um, where we get that from is Weather Service. Primarily, we are filtering and searching through National Weather Service products every winter. And we look through thousands and thousands per hour. We have an automated search essentially set up where we go through and look for anything that says ice jam, if you will, and then ultimately we're able to filter that down to what may actually be an ice jam, but we're not perfect, we don't have the system great. I have a couple of people that we actually just have to read through hundreds and hundreds of weather service reports every day to try to figure out what's happening from Alaska to DC, basically, you know, anywhere that might be ice jams, we are trying to pay attention. <coughs> We then, if we find out about an ice jam, we go out and search for other data, you know, to that, that would support, you know, or just display, you know, what's happening and explain um, stage weather conditions, all these things. So I look for at those gauges. We go through weather data, re record, you know, what has happened in the past. Look at what the forecast looks like and try to put all of this stuff together into the database so that progeny, or to, you know, in, in history, they'll be able to go back to our database and see what was occurring. Um, we are not above Googling, so I am constantly just looking for news stories on ice jams. They have, more often than not, the best information that we can get quickly, you know, um, and it, it tells us at least something about what's going on with the jam, because we're looking at Weather Service reports, and they are, a lot of the time, if they don't have an observer or somebody out in the field telling them where <laughs> ice jam's happening, they're looking at gauge data, too. And they're saying, well, this gauge, you know, sure looks like an ice jam has just occurred. We don't really know what's happening between this gauge and this one. So it's somewhere in here, <laughs> in miles and miles of river. This is where the, it, but when a reporter goes out and actually takes a picture and, you know, puts it up on the internet, I actually get more information from that than, you know, a lot, a lot of the time than anywhere else, unless I have a first-hand observer, um, emergency manager like yourself. If people <coughs> know my name and know my contact info, sometimes they'll give me a call, and let me know what's going on in their community, and that's uh, in the moment. I realize, you know, unless we are already working on some kind of long-term project, that's just one more phone call or email for you know someone like yourself to make. And my job here is to convince you that it's worth it. I guess um, letting me know and putting that information up into our database, it stores it. We've got it now historically. We can look at something long term. We can go back after the fact and try to plan some kind of you know early warning system or um, you know long term mitigation measure, permanent solution, things that we'll talk about after this. 
without that initial information and, and groundwork set, it's very difficult to start from nothing and from just <coughs> stories of you know what it looks like. You need hard data and facts to really get something going. We do provide support for emergency management um, in the moment, you know, as things are occurring. Most of the time, the best way to do this is know your local Army Corps emergency manager. I don't have funding. I'm not some, I don't know, you know, well-paid government employee that can just jump on a plane at a moment's notice and go somewhere. It doesn't work like that. Um, the way I go somewhere is when your emergency manager <coughs> in your local core district is willing to bring me out. If they need, if that local core manager needs help, they're not, if they, you know, aren't versed in it themselves or they think it, it warrants bringing Krell out and us, you know, looking at a situation, that's how I move and go places. Um, <coughs> In the moment, I'm, we're more than happy to talk to people on the phone. Um, quite often, you know, you can get linked up to us through your core manager. They know how to contact me. Everybody here at the end of the day today will know how to contact me, and that's fine. It's always good to include the, your local core district, though, because keeping them in the loop and apprised of the situation just, you know, helps keep everybody in the know. When, Yes, sir. Who is local POC for the core in this region? Do we have I'm not sure. I'm going to defer to you guys. Where are we? It's uh, <laughs> the Baltimore District. It's Dory Murphy. Dory Murphy is our Chief of Emergency Management in Baltimore. Okay. Yeah, all depends on what base you're in, pretty much. Um, so, usually, like I said, a lot of the time this is, you know, when an ice jam has occurred, that's when. <laughs> people are like, what can I do? Somebody call the call the government. Ask them. You know, call me. Find out what can we do to help. And that's fine. We love that. You know, give us a call. And we'll do what we can over the phone. I talked last winter when that January when we had that thaw. I didn't get off the phone for like a week. It was insane. I was taking phone calls at nine o'clock at night and you know whatever else folks up in Alaska and stuff. It's crazy. But when you talk to us ahead of time and call us and we actually start a conversation and you. Tell me about your community. Like I said, it's not like we have this huge group of people that look at the whole country and are versed in everyone's problems all over the place. It's me and, and the guys that I work with, but I'm the first person you call. I'm the only one during the winter that's actually paying attention to the whole country like at the same time. So I don't know what everybody's problems are <laughs> in any given moment. You gotta call me tell me, talk to me, you know, in the summer, let's start talking about what you've had going on in the past and maybe there's something I can help you do ahead of time or build at least like an early warning system or a process of um, what you guys should be looking at in your local community so that you're not just, you know, get a phone call at 2 a.m., holy shit, everything's flooding. <laughs> you know, it might be, we, we might be able to help ahead of time before we even do some kind of like permanent mitigation. Okay. But what we've got in there right now for Pennsylvania, eh, 1,200, give or take, events are documented in our database for PA. Uh, these date back as far as the late 1700s, um, going from November to April, meaning depending on where you are and what has happened in the state, we've got freeze up, break up, you guys got, you know, everything, all kinds of problems. It's not just like you have one issue, is all that means. Um, Couple hundred, you know, located on a couple hundred rivers and streams and hundreds of locations. It's essentially all of them. You, know, you can see that here, just a nice little hotspot map. It's it's not like you guys have a you know a region that doesn't get hit. I guess is the only thing all this shows. And where will be tomorrow? Oil Creek, Oil City. Biggest issues, Susquehanna, I know, was had, I remember they had all a bunch of stuff around Scranton and Wilkes Bar last year going on. Um, I'm not too familiar. What are the, anybody, any recent events around here anybody had huge problems with? Anybody want to ask a question now while we're at it, or maybe wait until we get into mitigation and I'll spark a thought? Good. Doing all right. So, we'll get into mitigation now. Um, 
talk about advanced early warning type measures, talk about emergency measures, and permanent solutions. First, for advanced measures, our goals are flood protection, reduce the ice supply coming from upstream, control the breakup sequence of the river ice, um, or increase the conveyance of ice through that, that river. Uh, typically, these are non-structural inter interventions that uh, in core speak non-structural, you know, meaning we're not pouring concrete or building anything usually. Uh, weeks to months lead time. This is when, you know, you guys, somebody calls me ahead of time in the spring or summer and we start talking about stuff before ice season, that, that means. Can be inexpensive. Um, and effectiveness difficult to quantify. All I, I state that in these, and that's really just because um, there isn't some, there, there isn't really a large scale uh, geographic or temporal research going on into a lot of these methods across the country. And that's primarily due to lack of funding and interest. Um, a lot of the times, some of these type mitigation measures that we're gonna talk about have been implemented in a handful of locations, but maybe only for a year or two. And then the winter is such that it doesn't really cause a lot of ice jams. People kind of forget about it. They don't do anything for a few years, and then they have an ice jam again. And they haven't maybe implemented, you know, those early warning, those advanced measures that year because, eh, it wasn't bad last year. Let's not look at it. So there's not like a long-term record of success and failure for individual given, you know, mitigation techniques for the most part. Um, but what these, what has been done, and some of the things that can be done, you know, that we look at is uh, for early warning, uh, motion, ice motion detectors. And these can be typically what they've been in the past is an, an anchor. This is usually used on an ice cover in place. So um, trying to look for when breakup will occur. So if you, if you think about it, you have an intact ice sheet, you go out there with a cable and an anchor, you stick that in it, you string that cable to a radio transmitter or something on the bank, tied to a tree that won't get destroyed by a giant ice flow at some point in time. And if that ice moves, those two like parallel cracks form and the ice sheet shifts, it'll trip that sensor and send somebody an email or a phone call and let them know so you can say, hey, emergency manager, first responder, it's 3 a.m., nothing good happens after, you know, 2 a.m., that's when all the problems occur. Get out there and go look at it and see what's going on. Um, now, those, along with things like, you know, a trained observer, boots on the ground, or, you know, web cameras, this had to, to be able to provide information that's timely and helpful, they, it needs to be a system that's designed. You know, it's not just, we've had ice jams at this location, let's put a camera on it. It's, we gotta look up and downstream in the whole system maybe on TRIBS, something else that feeds this ice jam, you know, that, that typically occurs or whatever in town. That's what we're looking for. So it's, it's something that's designed on a larger scale than, you know, just some camera on one bridge or something like that. It's bigger than that. Um, but these things, you know, we can do it ahead of time, design it. It would, it provides, you know, information that emergency managers and folks would need to, you know, make um, preparations, whether it be flood fighting or evacuations or things like that. Um, to, you know, if it's done well, obviously it can be uh, relatively inexpensive and can be adjustable. Here's kind of an example. Last time Krell was directly involved with ice motion detectors, it was about, I think it was 2010, up in Maine, on the River, we did this. Trained observers, we'll talk the weather service, we'll talk more about this later, but really it can be, you know, whether it be uh, local officials or members of the community, part of an emergency response team, you know, can be at least, uh, and their help, you know, can be used to track pre-event, you know, before an ice jam happens, ice conditions looking up and downstream, <coughs> can be very helpful for after action assessments and permanent measure designs. Advanced measures, so, first one would be mechanical weakening. And the idea is to weaken an ice sheet before nature would do it. So if you remember that typical breakup, you know, jam that we showed before, one of the initiation points can be a, a downstream ice cover that's still in place when the breakup ice from upstream comes down. Well, if we start to weaken that ice downstream um, by cutting, boring holes, things will show, you know, after this, if we, we do that ahead of time, 
we can theoretically get it to move downstream and flow out of the river before that natural breakup ice comes down, but thereby opening up the channel and just allowing ice to continue. Um, it can, there can be issues with it. Uh, there are met different methods, mechanical and thermal methods, but the issues can be one of the things that would have to be designed is what's downstream. Let's not just create a problem for the next folks. You know, let's not just send all the ice to them and cause a jam there. So we have to plan and design and think about all that and where it's going to go. Um, usually it would be implemented a, two to a few weeks before breakup. The, the tricky thing here where the designing engineering comes into it would be if you just start cutting holes in an ice sheet in the middle of the winter, you're just going to freeze again. <laughs> You've got to plan it with the weather, essentially, so that you actually get the most bang for your buck and you're not out there twice <laughs> cutting those. Um, or throwing warm water into it. Like the, show. the fact that it's <coughs> been difficult to quantify because this hasn't been done consistently in the same locations over time in some kind of long term you know, research really has been spotty methods here or there that where these things have been tried and you know, succeeded and failed. Um, but some of the methods would be like ice cutting or drilling holes using trencher, augers, or amphibious ice saws. <coughs> Breaking would be like amphibious excavators or vessels, coast guard, you know, breakers. Um, here's kind of the idea. You can, this, this pattern that we cut over here, this is meant to mimic how it will occur in nature. Typically you have those, you have two long cracks like we said before along the banks, some distance in depending on the river channel and geometry. And then as time goes on and that ice weakens and flow increases, you kind of have a pressure wave come down, you know, a wave come down and that'll cause these transverse cracks. So you have these large pieces of ice and as they continue, they shift and move and they break up into smaller pieces and that's how the ice will move down. So you know, the main takeaway here is that it, it, it needs to be designed for the given river, the pattern that you cut, you know, to mimic what will naturally occur there. You can't just if you go, you can just go out and start cutting holes in it, but it may not help or work unless it's done the way that river typically breaks up. Um, Joe, what, yes. what would you be using to cut the river? Like so the there, river there's, <laughs> yeah, I see. <laughs> there's um, different uh, trenching saws, like you know something that you would use to trench in earth. There are ice cutting saws. Uh, Canadians do a lot of this. And stuff up there, but it's sometimes can be you know off the shelf. Other times there are there's special <coughs> equipment designed in. So to do something like that, you're putting a piece of machinery out yes. on the. Yes. Yep. Yeah. But that's all part of the you know. If, yeah, you, it's something that's designed, planned ahead of time. You know, ice thickness is measured and known before you go out there with any machinery. So here's the the more expensive. Fun stuff, you know, Coast Guard icebreakers, hovercraft, if you got one of those, you know, we can use that, that'd be fun. Call me, I want to see it. Um, yes? Uh, mechanical mitigation, when is it justified, and are there permits for the port that need to be made? Permitting, I regulatory, I mean, I, we could, I could connect you with the, it's site specific. Okay. All of them have to consider protective measure. Yeah, I, I, that, I think, I don't know, it's, it's not something that's like just a, blanket statement anywhere. It really would depend on what you're looking at, I would think, you know, and how big a river is, what other environmental concerns are there, the state you're in, the, you know, those local rules and regs too. Um, but it's, yeah, that's typically something that, that comes into play is the permitting. It's not always easy. Um, Amphibex, that's kind of, that's used, they use up in Maine once in a while, but more often the Canadians have those to clean out um, deep intakes or hydroelectric facilities clear. Um, Coast Guard breakers are used up in the Great Lakes and up in Maine with the uh, amounts of the river a lot. So thermal weakening. Two kind of methods of thermal real quick. Dusting. Um, this was out in the Platte River in Nebraska. <coughs> they actually use like crop dusters and throw sand, silt, gravel, things out there on the ice make it darker to increase solar absorption, solar radiation absorption. And then the theory is that it'll warm up the ice sheet and help weaken it ahead of time. This has been done up in Vermont, on Lenoski, near us. They've um, used hydro cedars on roads next to the river and thrown 
leaves and mulch out onto the ice. Uh, one of the issues that comes up with this is depending on timing and weather forecast, if you do this and then it snows, <laughs> it just turns white again. And then you've got environmental and permitting issues where you're dumping sediment on a river system. So that, depending, yeah. depending on where you are, state, local, that can be a problem. Um, so that's kind of what we had for advanced measures. I'm more than happy to you know, talk more about those or other issues also later. Um, emergency measures. Goals are pretty much the same, except you may also <coughs> want to remove the ice jam that's in place. Uh, cost and effectiveness totally depend on timing and the individual situation you know that you're that you got there. We can include you know we can talk about briefly excavation, blasting, flood fighting, or doing nothing. So first, excavation is about timing. Excavation at stage rising. So this is when you have an ice jam in place and the water behind it is still rising. We still, you know, stage is increasing. It doesn't seem like the flooding has met any kind of equilibrium and it's going down. We're just, we're still going up. It's still getting worse. And what that means, the reason that, could, you know, what we gotta think about is there could very well still be ice coming down the river. So the jam could be getting bigger as time goes on if you wait you could have to remove more ice <laughs> later, as opposed to getting on it right away. Um, whether or not this will work really kind of depends on the individual jam, what you guys have seen like in the past, you know, what, if, the, um, if there's room on the overbanks to maybe, and, and the ice is typically up and into the overbanks, could you just cut like a diversion around the main channel and allow some relief? of uh, you know, stage and may not drop all the flooding, but you can know, do a little bit more. That's why I say it's very site specific because it depends on what your river looks like right there. If you're in a uh, steep river valley you know, with virtually no floodplains, pretty typical to Northern New England, like where I am, it doesn't really, you know, might not do a whole lot because it's not like the, even if you open up that ice, if that ice starts moving, moving downstream, it's just going to stop somewhere else, you know, a little bit downstream. It's not, it does, it's not like it has a big floodplain or somewhere to spill out into or to, you to be able to move it to or anything. Um, so that's why I say it depends. But equipment, you know, to do this because of the timing, because you got to do something fast, really this depends on like how much do you know about your system? Is this something that's a perpetual problem every year in the same location? If we know about that and we have a good idea, a handle on you know weather forecast that it's going to occur again, pre-position equipment. You've got a standing contract, you know, with somebody. DPW's got the equipment and it's already out in place, and you've planned not only access but egress <laughs> because if the ice is really bad and, it, and you know that it comes up in the floodplain, you got to make sure you can get that hell out if you need to. You know, um, typically we're working on downstream of the toe of the jam can be. You know, nerve-wracking, like we say, because you're still working in equipment behind a wall of water. You know, so you gotta kind of, you know, know the, the the characteristics of the ice jam, how you know high the stage usually gets behind the ice jams you're dealing with, maybe, and what the limitations of the machinery is and the operators. Um, can be inexpensive relative to excavating later, if you will, just because theoretically or possibly you're dealing with moving less ice when the stage is still rising, you could still have ice coming down, like we said before. Um, sometimes, depending on the jam, you can get lucky, and you know this would be kind of due to local knowledge and expertise, like if you look at it and somebody played Jenga, you know, or what's the other one, one of you, you know, move <coughs> one piece and everything falls, sometimes, you know, that's the case with these ice jams. You can have a couple of key, large pieces of ice that are in place and kind of holding everything back. And if you can work off a bridge or off a bank with a long arm or something and just strategically move one, things might break free and continue. Blasting, the fun stuff. Unfortunately, it doesn't usually work a good lot in our research, if you will. Um, the core, every emergency manager I've talked to in the core, it's not something that we're gonna, and correct me if I'm wrong, maybe one of you guys are different, but for everybody I've talked to in, you know, in my time looking at this stuff, we're not gonna pay for it. We're not gonna really get involved in it. It doesn't mean it won't work. It doesn't mean you can't do it because mechanically, 
It's the same thing as moving the ice with an excavator. It's just a lot faster and a lot more fun. <laughs> um, the idea is the same, you know, but again, work with demolition experts. We are not demolition experts at Grell. That is not. I am hydrology and hydraulic engineering background, you know, we do not get into designing charges and placement and demo plans. We don't do that. That would be somebody at a local level or, you know, I don't know, National Guard. I don't, we don't, we haven't gotten into that since I've been at Grell. That's not something that we get into. Um, we've looked at instances where folks have done it um, in recent past and I'm not aware of a time that it's worked. And there's a differentiation between blasting an ice cover that's in place that you can go out on and drill and know how thick that ice is and have a plan to maybe break up like a downstream ice cover ahead of time. That would be more like mechanical weakening. But an ice jam in place, trying to you know, get charges set and actually blow up an ice jam, that's what I'm saying we don't have evidence that it you know, has worked recently anywhere that we've seen it done. Um, because I think there's just so many unknowns. You don't know how thick the jam is. How are you, you uh, it's very dangerous to walk out on. You gotta figure out a way to place charges. If you're just placing something on top, it doesn't do anything. You're at, you have to you know, drill, get into it underneath it. And um, when you don't know how big it is or you know, how, how thick an ice jam is or how strong each piece of ice is, it's too hard. We hear stories all the time, like not suitable for urban areas, because planning, planning, planning on something like this. I heard from folks up in upstate New York, they attempted to blow an ice jam. They have a very urbanized stream section through town, concrete, all this and that, everything else, and they have like a known location <coughs> where ice jams occur all the time. And they worked with local demo contractor to you know try to blow an ice jam that stays in place, that would like freeze in place every winter. And they didn't think about where that ice was, the pieces were going to go after they hit the charge. Dozens of cars that were in parking lots on either side of the stream just were crushed by pieces of ice and everything in town and all this liability. And, you know, there's always, my point to that is not to make fun or, you know, make light. It's just there's, with blasting, with demo, there's always something somebody doesn't seem to think about. Uh, excavation at stage falling. So this is, all, you know, contrary to what we were saying before stage rising. This is when your ice jam is still in place, but gauge data and local observation shows that you know the, the flooding has pretty much stopped. It's either the stage is decreasing, flooding, the water's going down, or it's just kind of staying the same and holding in place. And at that this point. The reason maybe we get out there is you're, you're worried about like a secondary flood threat. You're either worried about that ice jam breaking free and that giant wall of water going downstream and causing problems for some downstream community, or weather is such that you're worried about it freezing more in place and being there for the rest of the winter, and then when you have increased flow causing even higher you know stages later in the spring, something like that would be your concern. So you look to clear the channel or some section of it, um, cut a bypass through a floodplain if the ice was you know, that far up into the floodplain or something. Again, dislodging key pieces can work when it, if it's not frozen in place. We had issues last year all through the Northeast where you're probably familiar with where these you know, midwinter breakup jams formed and then you'd have hundreds of yards or miles of ice just frozen solid in a river once it kind of freezes in place, I mean, this, you know, the effort just becomes exponential, you know, compared to earlier on. Um, access can be difficult if you're not ready for it, because especially if you're trying to access through a floodplain and, you know, if you're waiting until all this ice has accumulated, depending on the location and what the geography looks like, you can have ice that spills over into the floodplains and, you know, where normally you thought few months ago, oh, we'll just drive the excavator down through the farmer's field, you know, whatever else, but now it's a moonscape of 10 foot pieces of ice you can't get through or something like that. Or it takes time to get through because you have to cut your own access just to get to where you want to go. It can, you know, all that has to be thought about. <coughs> Examples, you know, it's really nice if you have a location like a bridge or something where maybe not, you know, even if 
right? Like he gets to the point, I don't know what this one looked like right upstream there, but if you're able to you know, move some of it and then get the machinery up onto a bank or onto a bridge to like work the rest of it free, then you're not necessarily dealing with as much of a threat of you know, something getting flooded. Um, or you can just go crazy old school and run a dozer up in the creek <coughs> bed. We had, there's an example, we had a project a few years ago, still working with them up in Alaska and Anchorage on Jay Bear, my base Elmendorf Richardson Air Force Army Base, <coughs> where, um, I know we're running short, but oh, this, is, this is worth it. So they, the base was built World War II, right? And back then, you know, Alaska was wild west and do whatever the hell you want there, basically. And the permits, whatever, it's Army, they just have their own land and it's just their playground. So at the time, they had built a power plant there and power plant effluent, it's 55 degree Fahrenheit water, just pumps right into a salmon river, salmon creek, you know, right there and flows out to the bay. Um, they never, you know, they're grandfathered in, they can do what they want, the army, whatever, and that was going on and on forever until about 10, 15 years ago or something, yeah, something like that. The power plant went offline. So no more 55 degree water into the creek in the winter. And there's a lot we can talk about here. There's a lot that went into it, geology, hydrogeology, it was a, it's a very unique location. It's kind of the perfect storm of crazy right here. And in a dip, so then they also had a fish hatchery that used some of that warm water to keep their tanks and everything fish alive and the tanks open in the you know, Anchorage winter. They kept operating with some deep wells they had. They had well that was down in a confined aquifer that wasn't really you know, as affected by atmosphere conditions. So they were able to pump water out into the creek and it wasn't that bad and then that fish hatchery went offline also so now we're basically back to nature but we're in an area where the army in its infinite wisdom decided to in this 10-year period build residences for officers and enlisted on both floodplains of this creek <laughs> in this glacial till area where it's known in alaska if you've ever been up there i mean rivers don't <coughs> move like all over the freaking place all the time they don't just stay in their channels when you get that close to the ocean. So they had anchor ice issues and their way of dealing with it for the past 10 years, they have a permitted you know, process in places with, you know, with permission of Alaska Fishing Game because this is what they had to do to protect all these residences. Two cat D8s up and down the creek three days a week. It was insane. <laughs> I mean, we're talking three to four feet of ice just getting bulldozed like <laughs> back and forth, back and forth. And these guys breaking machinery every time they go in. The, these, I saw guys full Mustang suits. They don't even care anymore because they're doing this so much. They're so normalized to it. They're like tied around their waist in like negative 20 weather, running up and down the creek, bulldozing this ice, piece of ice as big as this table coming over the blade and shattering the, you know, one of the cabin doors or windows. And the guy not even blinking and just <laughs> continuing on. Like it, it's crazy the stuff that people do you know, to, to work on this, to try to solve the problems. So it, it, it's, it's been done, and those things can be effective, but they're just dangerous and costly, <laughs> was the idea, and that's where we come in trying to come up with a better solution for them. Joe, I have a question about that. Sure. Is he upstream or downstream of the jam? He, downstream. Um, so if he's, is there a jam up behind him? Up, up <coughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So what's what happening? Happens? He's working at the toe. Okay, so breaks through there. Yep, that's the concern. Okay. <laughs> yes. right. you're, not, you're not wrong. That's, that's, that's the limitation with this. You, it's, you can only do so much, and that's why it's dangerous and scary. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> the, the, the goal being you don't stay in the channel up until that point. You try to manage it until you get, and then like, it's getting close. Okay, let's get out on the bank. It's let's work close to the bank. That I would be I would certainly hope he's in a, like a some kind of Mustang suit survival sub something suit. right emergency personnel oh, with on or something yeah something so they can find at least you, find you, it's a pet it probably depends on the town you're in because some of these places up by us where I live pretty small towns with not a whole lot of personnel or they just need like a you know somebody doing this yes yes thank you about it all right let's keep moving. Uh, flood fighting, I'm going to kind of fly through this because it's nothing crazy, but sometimes, you know, if there isn't a, uh, a way to move the jam or do anything, flood fighting can be the best method. 
Um, depends on atmospheric conditions, what we think the jam is going to do in the future. It may be that like we just got to protect what's here, try to protect infrastructure with typical methods, sandbags, dikes, feedback plans, um, and combine that with removal. Or sometimes do nothing is best. That can be um, especially later in the season, like a, a, a late spring um, jam where a lot of thermal meltout has happened, and that's where like we can come into play, like this is an emergency thing, the ice jam's in place, you guys call us, what do we do? Do we spend all this money and try to move the jam and do anything? Well, depending on what the preceding weather has been like, we can kind of make some assumptions about how strong the ice is, how thin and you know, weak basically it is, and if the forecast is such that we don't think the jam's gonna stay in place very long, it may be the best and the least risk you know, alternative to just let it sit and let nature take its course along with flood fighting behind it. Um, permanent measures. So I kind of blew it and we only have five minutes. So I'm gonna fly through this and we'll have, and if, and we might have to leave some for questions or something also later at the end. But the goals pretty much are always the same except we want it, this one, we may want to control breakup sequence and also displace the jam location. These are structural. This is where, you know, something like the boom um, out in, uh, on the Allegheny and Oil City, you know, that, that is the idea. Um, lead time is years, because this involves whole, you know, research, design, specs, everything. This is like construction project I'm talking so. Um, typically, though, high benefits, reliability coming from that is generally costly, although lower cost solutions are in development depending on the actual so it can be things like ice booms and weirs like we just talked about. Really what it requires to design something like this is to have a geography. You've got to have an area um, upstream of your flooding, you know, where, where, you're, where you're trying to mitigate flood problems that can contain the ice where we can keep it, whether we have um, just room in the channel or we have room in the floodplain or something to, to hold ice. You need to find that spot. You also need to find an area in the river where you've got lower velocities. Uh, and that's because otherwise, if the ice pieces as they're moving on stream is moving too fast for the size of the boom, they'll simply hit the boom, push the boom underwater, and flow right over it, generally. Uh, if you don't have a location, and these are typically for freeze up, sorry, for like frazzle ice problems, is where we'll use booms and stuff because the slush is floating and moving down um, slowly in these areas. If you don't have that slow moving velocity, we can create it. Um, environmentally, permitting problems can, you know, pose an issue, but you, sometimes you can create, you build a weir, country, uh, you basically create a small pond or something in the river to slow down velocities, and either by itself or in conjunction with a boom, you can prevent frazzle ice from moving downstream like that. Here's the example, so this is the, the system over there in Oil City, they've got the, the boom out there in the Allegheny River, and then up on Oil Creek, they've got a weir, actually, an ice control structure that actually kind of functions as both, even though it was meant to be a uh, frazzle mitigation structure. Both meaning it, it stops and break up on this frazzle. Um, here's some other examples of ice control weirs that have been built around the country. There's the one on the left is up in Cherryfield, Maine, on the Narragogas River, we may be looking at soon again um, to help uh, sand aquatic organism passage. Um, there's the Oil City boom and up in Lancaster, New Hampshire, also. So another one is breakup ice control structures, and the idea here is to retain the ice cover through breakup or to stop an ice run in a safer location, you know, further upstream, out of town. Uh, and the, one of the main design constraints is you have to allow flow, river flow through the structure or through a bypass channel up and around it, otherwise water will just pick the ice up and shoot it right over the top of these are typically tier type structures. So here's the most recently constructed one in 2006. This was built in on Casanova Creek in Buffalo, New York. Um, just a couple of photos, aerial photos, modeling at Krell, and webcam of it functioning first winter. Are this piers concrete? It is um, concrete in case steel. Okay. They're huge. They're like Somewhere between 
five to eight feet in diameter and eight, ten feet tall, something like that. Does it work? Does that hear that? Absolutely works. Yes. Problem is, we'll get to that next. Well, oh, hold on, let me fly through these other examples. <coughs> the same idea. It works too well. <laughs> so, what do you debris? Think about it. <laughs> 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 You're in a river. Want to are going to stop ice? They're going to stop everything. <laughs> now, there's there's newer methods of building these that, that have been ongoing research topics where you don't just put a straight wall of piers across the river and we try to maybe channel debris to one side or the other so that there's still um, so that you don't cause open flow concerns like this became um, but that's an obvious problem and any project like this is going to have an O and M you know component to it. Uh, Get conclusions will be lead time. You know, the more lead time we have for a permanent solution, the more effective it can be. Give us time to design, time to test, time to research. You know, we can do better, obviously. Emergency measures should be the last resort, but you know, that's usually where all this stuff starts. We have a problem with that. What do we do? And then we move from there, try to work on advance early warning, and, and then try to identify a permanent solution as time goes on. Uh, you know, there's always higher risk and uncertainty with advanced measures because we don't really know what we're getting into yet. We're doing, we're trying to implement something before we even have a problem, and the less we know about the system you're working in, the river system you're in, the more unknowns we have. The, the more we develop these, you know, relationships and we look into your individual, you know, river systems and issues, the more we learn about it, the less um, uncertainty. <coughs> and then cost-effective ice control technology is always improving for both freeze-up and break-up. Um, reliable performance is possible and the range of applications expanding. One quick example is uh, nobody, you know, now I was saying before about building a weir to create slower velocity sections where a boom or something would work for freeze-up. Newer application of an existing technology is a inflatable weir. Nobody likes low head dams, essentially, when you come at it from a regulatory perspective anymore. You know, that's a problem. But in issues of both um, aesthetic and culturally intrinsic valuable rivers, like Wild and Scenic River Act and things like that, and um, recreation, you know, the issues with low head dams, putting in things like inflatable weirs, where there's concrete sills and these weirs can lay flat and be essentially invisible, you know, during spring and summer seasons and the higher open water flow and recreation periods, and then simply inflating them during winter time, that's one application of, you know, existing technology that's coming into uh, mindset. Yes. So, any questions before I step out? About 30 seconds over. <laughs> It will be. I probably left in my old training on here. Y'all can use your phone and take a picture of the screen too. Yeah, Smart man. <laughs> Smarter than I. All right, thanks a lot, Joe. All right. uh, as Joe said, he'll be around all day, so uh, yeah. I think we set aside time at the end for questions.